Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone, and um, it's uh, actually a pleasure to be here. Um, so today I'm going to share with you the, uh, a, a brief summary and the main results of a study that started in 2013, um, something that has been um, um, really a dream for me and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, what I would expect to be uh, one of the holy grails in uh, ocular biomechanics. Um, this study benefited from strong contribution from uh, this group. I think many of them you would see at a, uh, in, in this room. The, the main question we wanted to answer was, can we actually measure corneal stiffness or corneal biomechanics or corneal rigidity in vivo? The really good thing about this is that if we can crack um, this challenge, if we, can, if we can answer this question, we would be able to optimize and customize treatments and procedures that interact or interfere mechanically with the eye. You need to think about um, perhaps an, another field for, for a minute. Uh, engineering, numerical modeling has moved a long way over the last few years. In medicine, we are still way behind this. And I think if we are to move medicine into the field of numerical engineering, numerical modeling, and benefit from the huge accuracy that we can get in that field, we need to answer this question because we can answer questions about topography, about shape, about geometry, but we cannot at the moment answer questions about the mechanical properties. What I have at the bottom of the screen is a, is a, a number of examples that you can imagine benefiting from answer this question. One of them is refractive surgery, where we do not consider uh, corneal biomechanics in the, the planning of the procedure, the selection of corneal implants, the cross-linking, and so on. Um, I, I tried to, to make this uh, presentation um, 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 really simple, and, I, and please forgive me if this is too simple, but I, I want to start with what is stiffness? Stiffness is basically the resistance to deformation. So if something is not deforming a lot under load, we say it has high stiffness. And if it's deforming a lot, it has low stiffness. Stiffness itself is made of two components. And this is where the complexity comes in. It has geometric stiffness, and this is really easy to quantify. So we know that the geometric stiffness will increase with bigger thickness, <coughs> with, with bigger curvature, and with a smaller diameter. So this is, there is no problem in this sense. But the material stiffness is the problem. We cannot quantify it until now in vivo, and this is the focus of this work. If you imagine that, that you're, you're taking a, a piece of material, a cornea, a sclera, a whole eye, and apply pressure on it, let's say the IOP, um, if, the, um, if, you're, if, you're, if you need to apply a lot of pressure to achieve a small deformation, then this is an indication that this eye has high stiffness. If, on the other hand, a small pressure will, inc will produce a lot of deformation, this is an indication of low stiffness. I can convert load and deformation into stress and strain simply by normalizing these values. But the idea of moving from load to stress and deformation to strain is that you get this really important parameter, which we call the elasticity or the Young's modulus. And the Young's modulus is a really good measure of material stiffness. So again, um, um, this, the blue line is an indication of high stiffness, and, the, and the, the brown line is an indication of low stiffness. However, in, in ocular biomechanics, we have a problem. Because the material is not, is not linear. The, if, as you apply pressure, and you get deformation, you find that the behavior is not linear. The behavior actually looks like this. And therefore, we do not have a tangent or an elasticity modulus. We do not have a youngest modulus. We have a tangent modulus. And this tangent modulus will change with the value of pressure or the value of stress. And therefore, we do not have a unique value of tangent modulus. And this is why when I read papers, talking about the tangent modulus in this, this tissue, I find this difficult to understand because there is no unique value of the tangent modulus. And therefore, if we are really going to crack this field, we have to pro pro produce the whole curve. But this is difficult. To produce the whole curve um, in vivo is, really, is, going to be, uh, is going to be difficult. However, there is an opportunity here. And the opportunity comes in the form of the experimental results that we have got over the years. 
So the behavior that we have, the stress strain behavior or the pressure deformation behavior for tissues, different ages, don't look like the lifts, but they look as the diagram on the right. So there is an opportunity here is that if we can choose one of these plots and consider this to be our benchmark, I can then create the other plots using a simple stretching factor. I can stretch it sideways in the strain direction or deformation direction to produce the other uh, uh, to, to produce the, 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 other, uh, the other plots. And this means that the, 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 the determination of the whole curve comes down to a single parameter, which is a stretching factor. It's a very, very simple idea. However, there is a very simple trick which can actually make this really, really useful. So if you consider that the behavior, uh, the relationship between stress and strain or, or pressure and deformation is exponential, which is the fact, this actually produces a relationship between a tangent and stress that is linear. The, 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 the really nice thing is that the stretching factor we are talking about here is not just to create another plot, but it's also the stretching factor itself also equals the a tangent ratio. So at the same stress, at the same stress, um, at the same stress, the, the ratio between E tangent for the first material and E tangent for the second material is the same as a stretching factor you're going to apply to move from one material to another. Okay, so how would it work? So imagine that you, you select a particular stress strain plot, use it as a benchmark, assume it has a stretching factor of one. Then other plots can be obtained using different stretching factors. And then for these plots, the E tangent ratio is the same as the stretching factor ratio. And then we're gonna call now the stretching factor, the stress strain index. So the challenge now is, can I determine the stress strain index for a particular eye in vivo or not? Because if I can, then it means that I can determine the whole stress strain curve and I can take this eye, stick it in a numerical model with the whole topography and I can generate a, an eye specific numerical model in both geometry and material behavior that I can then use to optimize treatments. Um, you may be aware of a company called uh, OptimEyes uh, um, based in Switzerland. They are trying to do something similar and they are basing their work now, they will be basing their work now on the stress strain index. Um, okay, the, the solution to this challenge came from the study that I mentioned that started in 2013. And in, and in this we had two objectives. Can I determine IOP that is not, in a way that's not, determined, that's not influenced by corneal stiffness? And can I determine the stiffness that's not dependent on the IOP? Um, for those of you who are familiar with the BIOP, will know that this is, this is an outcome of that study. But the, I need to explain to you really quickly, using very simple terms, why this challenge is really tricky. Tonometry techniques, however they are contact or non-contact, are based on a very simple concept. You take a ball, the ball has internal pressure, you apply force on the ball. The deformation of the ball is correlated with the pressure. So I can use the deformation of the ball to protect how much pressure I have um, inside the ball. So high pressure will give me small deformation, low pressure will give me large deformation. However, this also means that the measurement is dependent on the, on the ocular biomechanics. So how is that? So if you have an eye that is very thick, if you have an eye that's made of stiff material, you will also have st small deformation. And if you have, and, and Large deformation will also come from an eye with small thickness or an eye with soft material. So the dilemma here is very, very simple, using very simple terms. If you have a certain amount of deformation, your device will tell you that this gives you a certain IOP measurement. Okay, in reality, this can mean small IOP and stiff cornea. It can mean large IOP and soft cornea. It can mean anything in between. So the challenge here is how to separate the two from each other. And the interesting thing here is that if we can separate the two, then we will get an IOP measurement that's not affected by stiffness and stiffness that's not affected by IOP. I'm gonna start with the IOP measurement. Um, and the methodology is what we usually do always is start with numerical simulation, come up with a solution, validate it experimentally and then clinically. 
And I'm, I'm not going to go through this in, in detail, but basically you simulate lots of eyes, you simulate the Corvus process, and the output is the Corvus uh, measurement and the Corvus parameter, the Corvus deformation. And you come up with input parameters and output parameters, and these will then be rearranged to give you an algorithm that will give you a cornea, a biomechanically corrected IOP, and also an estimate of the SSI. So for those of you who are interested in the details of this, and I think this is not a venue to go through the, the details, I can, I can sit with you and explain to you in detail how this was done. Um, you will know that the, the BIOP has been uh, validated um, uh, several times, um, starting with um, experiments. So you take human eyes, control the pressure in them, use the corvus to measure the IOP, correct the reading, and see how they look. These are the true IOP readings. These are the corvus uncorrected IOP readings. As, as you can see, they are quite different from the true IOP. And with the correction, the BIOP, you get better readings, um, um, uh, more accurate estimates of the true IOP. Uh, we, then, we then tried uh, areas before and after LASIK and SMILE. Um, with GAT, you get differences more than three millimeter mercury. With CV, it was the Corvus uncorrected. Um, it's three millimeter mercury again. And then with the BIOP, you get differences that are lower than uh, one millimeter mercury. Uh, these results have been published. These are, these are the nine, um, nine publications that um, I got from our group, um, and actually the big group, um, on the BIOP, um, so it has, it has been published extensively. Now let's move to the SSI, which is really the topic of today. Um, uh, one way of assessing this is to say that actually SSI is material stiffness, so it should be correlated with age, because as we know, cornea becomes stiffer with age, but it should have really nothing to do with CCT or IOP. It should not be dependent at all on CCT and IOP. Um, we used two data sets, one from Milan, and one from uh, one from Brazil, and I think you can you can perhaps guess the source of these uh, data sets. Um, these are the results against age. You can see a strong correlation. Correlation with BIOP and CCT is quite low. And again, with the Rio uh, data data set, you get the same results. So again, with with age, strong correlation with BIOP and CCT, very little dependence. Um, we then did a big study that's slightly less than 4,000 or, or more than uh, 3,000 patients from across the world. So they were treated as one group. Um, one interesting finding here is that we can see the SSI dropping as you go from slightly dropping from healthy to form frost KC. Then there is a big drop from FFKC to mild keratoconus, moderate keratoconus, and severe keratoconus. And I, and I think these results are, are quite good. Um, you were getting the same trends uh, for the SSI against CCT and against uh, age as for the small groups. Um, one really important development, and I, and I, and I, um, our target is to present this in, um, in the cross-linking conference in Zurich, is that everything I spoke about so far has been about a single parameter, SSI for this eye, your eye, my eye. What would be really interesting is to translate this into a map. So instead of having a single value of SSI, you will have a map of FS, FSSI. And we have tried this in two eyes, one healthy and one keratoconic. This work is just starting. I'm hoping that it can be concluded before the December uh, conference in Zurich. And you can see that the one on the left um, has a map of SSI that doesn't show any localized weakening, while the one on the right is showing the weakness in the keratoconic area. So we're hoping that this would be used to optimize the treatment, the cross-linking treatment in terms of the biomechanics. Not only the values of SSI, but also the distribution of SSI. So, so this is, um, so I finish with this. Um, I think uh, uh, Ricardo is going to talk about um, um, using SSI before and after cross-linking. We wanted to show you case studies uh, where people have done cross-linking and had the SSI measured before and after and show you the level of stiffening. But unfortunately, we couldn't get this data in, in time. But basically, let me just strengthen this point again. We really want to take ocular biomechanics into the field of engineering 
numerical modeling where we can benefit from the same level of accuracy or hopefully the same level of accuracy that we can get um, from that field for other applications. And I think the SSI, if proven and uh, successful and if validated, would be a great success in, in that area. Thank you.